I'm really happy to bring you this episode today, but it comes with a content warning because it includes discussion of suicide. For a long time, I've wanted to have a story about hoarding. This is something I personally find really interesting. We've all seen pictures or videos of the inside of a home of someone who's a hoarder. And of course, the reality TV show, Hoarders, puts it right out there. And everyone sees that and wonders, how does someone allow their environment to get to that point? And then I discovered Margie. She works in the podcast industry. I guess you could say I knew of her. And then later we became more connected because she's a listener of this podcast and I've watched what she's been doing to achieve some amazing business success. When I found out that she had dealt with hoarding firsthand, I knew I wanted to have her on the show. But what I love about this story is that it's not just about the shocking reality of dealing with the hoarding issue. Some of the things Margie and I talk about are how she channeled grief into energy how a seemingly impossible challenge made her unstoppable. The one unexpected thing that a lot of high achievers have in common. And the bizarre name she came up with for her podcast. And just before you hear our conversation, here's a brief clip from the very first episode of Margie's podcast. It's evening on a city bus in Taipei, Taiwan. I've walked less than a block to get the bus, but my bright yellow shirt is already sticking to my skin. In this humid, subtropical climate, the AC is blasting year-round, and the air on the bus smells old and stale. It's 2015, and I'm 26 years old. I've been living in Asia as an English teacher for two years. I'm absolutely miserable, so naturally, I spend every morning on the commute to my teaching job furiously journaling about gratitude. Often, I'm writing down gratitude for things I wish would happen, especially pertaining to my family. My dad had recently been diagnosed with some mild heart issues, so to channel my panic into positivity, I'm writing daily about how grateful I am for his amazing health. That day had been an uncharacteristically good one. As I rode the bus home that night, I did some extra gratitude writing. I felt a rare moment of optimism. I wrote with total conviction how grateful I was for the day, and of course, for my dad's health and happiness. What I didn't know at this point is that my dad is already dead. Real people in unreal situations. There is a man standing in front of me in my bedroom. My friend has been shot. I'm in the literally inside the river and I'm inside my car. He had told me multiple times that he was going to set himself on fire. If you say my name or try to look at me, I'm going to kill you. And he was just sobbing. He said, Mom, Mom, tell me you're going to be okay. And I jumped on the hood of the car and I held on. And I looked into the garage and he was hanging from the rafters. I had somebody standing on my neck. He's better to me dead. I want him dead. I'm Scott Johnson, and this is What Was That Like? Have you ever caught yourself deciding to keep something rather than throw it away and thought, oh, wow, I'm becoming a hoarder? Yes, all the time. And it's like one of those things where I think so much of my life So much of the, so many of the things I do in my life are sort of like doing the opposite of what my parents did, which I think is true for a lot of people. But having learned so much about hoarding after realizing that that's what I was experiencing in my home growing up, one of the pieces of research on hoarding is that it gets worse. as as you age. So someone who is really a severe hoarder at 70, at 30 and 40, it was probably much lighter than that. So that that fact alone, and I hope I haven't made your listeners too paranoid, but like that, yes, because I always think that like, what's this going to look like in 30 years? That's definitely something to think about. Well, let's, we need to do, give a little bit of background on this and what kind of led up to it. You were living in Taiwan for a couple of years as an English teacher. 
but you previously lived in the U.S. How did you, what made you decide to go and live abroad? I fell in love with travel when I was um, in my junior year of college because I grew up in Rhode Island. I went to college in Rhode Island. Like I just stayed in Rhode Island. And and I think most of my life up until this turning point that we're going to talk about, I was very stagnant. I felt stuck. I felt like a victim about it. I just, I was one of those people who like the decision was no decision. Like I just kept defaulting into these situations and then kind of mentally complaining about them. But there were these moments, right, where I would feel an impulse to to actually do something that was different, that sort of broke the script. And studying abroad was one of those things. After, you know, dragging through college and not wanting to be there and just not really participating. And I, and I you know, I, I don't think college is as valuable as most people think it is. But but my attitude did not help. And after all of that dragging, it was like I heard about studying abroad. I was like, I want to do this. Like, I want to live in Italy. It'll be so great. I was an art and Latin major. So I was like, this is a great opportunity to become a better painter. At that point, I wanted to be a professional artist, a professional oil painter. And so I was like, this will be great. And it was just this sort of like different moment. Like I just suddenly switched it up. And that's what I really love about travel. It has the ability to shake things up. And I think when you feel stuck or you get into this routine, even if it's a good routine, being able to go somewhere far away for a little bit, you just, you're like a different person. Like you're more yourself. You're more present. You're discovering things for the first time. When you're out of your routine, I think you realize how much your routine kind of starts to control you and how how much more there is to you and how much more free you actually are. And so that's why I love travel. And because I had fallen in love in my junior year of college with that feeling, and especially living somewhere um, where I hadn't even visited before, I wanted to do that again. So I wanted to move somewhere that I had never even visited. And then I went down this rabbit hole of teaching English, and I was looking at South America, I was looking at Asia, narrowed it down because I learned that you can make a lot more money in Asia, you can save a lot more money than you can in South America, at least at that time. And so that's how I picked Asia. And then I had never, I knew nothing about Taiwan. I had just been researching the best countries to teach English in. It came down to Korea and Taiwan. I was planning to go to Korea. I got a background check, all the stuff that they require. And then I read something online and I was like, you know what? I think I want to go to Taiwan. And so pivoted, ended up going to Taiwan. And then fast forward two years, you were miserable. What happened that caused all that to change? I mean, my misery wasn't because of Taiwan. I love Taiwan, but it was everywhere you go, you take yourself with you. And I think when you're somewhere short term, like those benefits of travel we're talking about, when you're somewhere short term, you really do experience things as new and like you're this different, more open person. But once you live somewhere, no matter how exotic or cool it is, you get into a new routine. So that's kind of what happened to me in Taiwan. It's like people are like, oh, that's so cool that you live in Taiwan. And it's like, it is cool. But also you go to work, like you go to the grocery, like it's it's really different, but it's also kind of the same. But it wasn't Taiwan's fault, although it's swelteringly hot and I didn't like that. But it wasn't because of Taiwan. It was really because of my mindset. And this was a mindset that I had had, I think, kind of my whole life of really just kind of depressed and anxious and neurotic and negative and just really one of those people who's like, always expecting things to go wrong when something good happens is like, what's the catch or when is this going to get worse again? Like really just a pessimistic mindset. When we talk about what changed, you know, it's so difficult to lose a parent, even from natural causes. Had you ever considered that your dad might be suicidal? Were there any signs? No, not at all. And it's like one of those things where after the fact, you know, you look at things and you're like, should I have known based on this stuff? But like, I mean, he was on antidepressants, but like, who isn't? I mean, not who isn't like, I'm not an antidepressant, but a lot of people are, and it doesn't mean they're suicidal. And no, honestly, if you had asked me like, 
who in the family is going to kill themselves, he would have been my last guess. Like I would have thought my mom would have. (laughs) Sorry, mom, if you're listening. But like he was just like this rock for the family. Like he, you know, when we were just like both like melting down, he was just like calm, cool and collected, breaking the tension with a joke, making sure everyone got where they needed to be on time. Like he just he was like the rock of the family. He was like anytime anything happened, I'd be like, dad, help me. (laughs) And like, you know, so no, I didn't see the signs at all. I knew he was kind of quirky, but no, it was nobody. Even like his psychiatrist was like shocked. Everybody was totally blindsided. And I, from talking to other survivors, that that's more common than people think. There are people who die by suicide who've had attempts and stuff like that. And that doesn't make it easier. But he was one of those people that it really was like totally out of left field. And when I found out that he had died. I was like, oh my God, he had a heart attack or something like that. So no, like no idea. I still can't believe that that happened. Can you just describe the experience of getting that news? Yes, I can. I left school in the evening. I was teaching a few different classes, but one of them was this really, this really rowdy class of first grade boys. And they had been, they were just kind of rough because they were boys. And one of them like was joking about like killing a cat or something. Like he wouldn't have actually done it. It was just like being crazy. But I was like, actually, that's not funny. Like, let's talk about compassion towards animals. And then I went to the Taiwan SBCA who I was fostering cats through. And I said, hey, can I get you all in here to talk to these kids about being kind to animals so that we can like, have an impact here and and they'll think differently because they do think a little bit differently in Taiwan about animals than they do in the US. And we ended up I raised money from all the teachers who wanted them to come to pay them to come speak. They like brought a dog and it was great. Like the kids prepared questions, they were really engaged, they were really interested in the dog. So as I'm walking out of the school to go catch my bus, I'm like feeling amazing because I just pulled off this thing that had been months in the making that I'm like, wow, I like really had an impact here. Like these kids are going to be more compassionate towards animals. Like that was amazing. And then I looked at my phone and it wasn't a smartphone because it's really hard to get a smartphone in Asia as a, an immigrant. So I had, um, it was like a really old school regular phone. And I had a text from my partner at the time that just said, I love you with no punctuation, which is like, it's just one of those things that's like not a great sign. If, if you know someone always uses like exclamation points and stuff like that, like, and you just, yeah. So I was like, that's weird. And I had the thought like, oh, I hope something didn't happen. And then I had the thought of, I hope, and this is terrible, but this is what I actually thought. I was like, well, I hope if something did happen, it happened to his family and not to mine. This thought happened in a second, like, but then it was gone. I didn't ruminate on it or anything. It was just like there and then it was gone. And then I got on the bus and I'm reflecting on the day and all this stuff. Like I really, I really didn't think anything was going on. So I get off the bus, I walk to our apartment, I go up, we're on like the ninth floor, I go up the elevator, um, I open the door, I've got like my big bag with my like books and stuff to greet in it. I walk in and it's like a tiny, tiny, like the smallest studio apartment you've ever seen in your life. Um, And I walk in with my bag and I'm walking across to hang out my bag and I looked at my partner and he was someone who has like an olive skin tone and he was like white. He looked like a ghost and it just, it was, I never seen him like that. And when you see somebody that you know really well and they're just like, so I could feel it in my body. I could feel like my cheeks tingling. I was starting to feel like cold and kind of like clammy in my hands. Like it happened so fast. So I hung up my bag and I'm like in the closet where I keep my bag like hanging up and I'm like, what's up? And he was like, you need to call your mom. So my parents were still together. So like people say call your parents, you know what I mean? Like when your parents are together. So I was like, huh. 
And so I'm like starting to panic, but it's like there's two things going on because I've got this rising panic and I'm starting to feel, and I can feel it now, I'm starting to feel like sick to my stomach kind of, like that's rising. But then there's also this part of me that's like, well, like maybe it's not as bad as it could be. Like let's like, you know, still trying to almost negotiate with reality. And so I'm like trying to get hints from him because I don't like surprises. Everybody knows this. And I always demand information from people trying to do surprises for me. So I'm like, what happened? And he was just like, you just, you just need to call your mom. And I'm like, how bad is this? Thinking that if it's not the worst case scenario, there'll be some reassurance, right? Like if nobody's dead at that point, you'll say nobody's dead. And he didn't say that. And I'm like, Okay, but still there's a big part of me that's like, no way, no way is this happening to me. So I was like, I remember saying, is it the worst thing that could possibly happen? And he just said, you need to call your mom. So I'm like, oh, shit. Like, so I put my bag down. Also, it's 5 a.m. in the U.S. And he's saying, call your mom right now. He's not saying anything to reassure me. Like, it's it doesn't look good. But there's still an analytical part of my brain that's like, okay, you know what? He had an accident. He's in the hospital, but he's going to be fine. It's really serious, but he's going to be fine. Like, I'm, you know, it's just like happening so fast. And so I remember walking across, and it, it w- wasn't a lot of feet across because it was such a small apartment, but walking across the floor from my closet to this desk that was like a computer desk and a dining room table and like all a catch all of all the things where my computer is. And it felt like if you've ever seen someone try and bring a horse somewhere, the horse doesn't want to go and they're leaving it by the face. And it's just kind of like pulling back. I felt that. So like I saw that picture and that's what it felt like. It's like I knew I was walking towards a totally different life. And I was like, no, 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 no. But there was this inevitability. So it's like, I didn't want to get on Skype and find out because once I found out what was going on, I knew there would be no going back. But I was just like, I was like, no, I'm not ready for this. Whatever it is, like, no, no, no. I sit down at the computer. I call my mom. Of course, (laughs) Skype is like beep, boop, beep, boop, which is just like not the right mood. (laughs) No, you're Mm -hmm. on. Right. Very upbeat. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And so I'm just like, my hands are very, very cold at that point. And my stomach is very tight. And I feel this like tingling sensation in my face. My nervous system is just like kicking off. So my mom answers on Skype. It's 5 a.m. her time. She's not a morning person. She's up. She has, my mom has like blue hair. The color changes all the time, but it was like blue at this time. It was like clipped back. She had no makeup on. I can see that she's somewhere different. Like the background is not our house. And so like, so I'm very quickly taking all this in without being super conscious of it. So I'm like, hey mom, what's going on? Like never one to mince words. She says, dad's dead. He killed himself. So keep in mind, he was not in my mind, a suicide risk. (laughs) Like it was just, and for someone like me who had been so neurotic and spent so much time ruminating on possible bad things that could happen, even I (laughs) had never thought of this. And I thought I had thought of every unlikely bad scenario. So I'm sitting there with her, my hands start shaking really hard, like like really violent shaking, which again is like the nervous system going into fight or flight. And so I'm like, what happened? And she was like, we don't know. They need to look into it. There were some propane cans, but we don't know what happened. And then it was this wild thing. So I'm like shaking and freaking out. But I immediately go into like comforting her because there was like the survival part of my brain that was like, he's gone, protect the one you've got left. Because I'm very nervous now. Like if he would do that, like, is she okay? So I was just like, everything's going to be okay. We're going to get through this together. Like I just started reassuring, which was kind of surprising to me 
as a response. So the rest of the conversation is kind of a blur. She tells me she's staying at her friend Caroline's house. We had a lot of pets at that point because I take home stray animals a lot. So they had my two cats plus some other pets. So they had like five cats and a dog in the house. So she's staying with her friends. She said that people are going to the house and she's going to the house to take care of the pets. Then we, I got off the phone. I picked up my phone. I called my boss, who was like a good friend of mine at my teaching job. And I said, hey, Michelle, I'm not going to come to work anymore because my dad's dead. He killed himself. And she's just like, oh my God, are you okay? And I'm just like, I don't know. (laughs) Okay, bye. And she's just like, what? So it was just, it was crazy. And then I felt like I was going to throw up. The stomach issues, the stomach pain of that type of trauma was like a big part of it for me. So you, you knew immediately you had to go home. Yes. And I had been planning, I was coming to the end of my second year teaching anyway. So I was, this was January. My, he died on January 12th. I found out on January 13th, which is insane. Like having no idea that someone's dead and just like going about your normal life. But I was planning to come home in a few months. My teaching contract was about, I think, maybe a month from ending. And then I was planning to spend two months backpacking around Asia. And then I was going to come home and like find a real job. So at first it was like, what do we even do? Because it's like I had to go home, but it was like this big international move And you're really not in a headspace to be making big plans like that when you're grieving at that early stage, but you also usually don't have a choice if you're an adult. So I ended up, um, they cremated him. I, we did a viewing that I was Skyped into, which was absolutely insane. And then I decided because I had been planning this backpacking trip for two months to modify it to be one month, but to still go and travel around Asia for a month, and then come home. I don't know why I made that decision. I just felt like it was something that I needed to do. Wow, I didn't know that. So there was a month in between before you actually got back home. Yes, I. there was more than that because I needed to like do some stuff in Taiwan with my taxes. I had to close out all my bank accounts. Like There was just all this logistic stuff and then plan this trip. And then we went, we went traveling for a month and went to like Vietnam and the Philippines and Thailand, which was a bizarre trip. And then we, I don't, and I spent a lot of money. I was like, why did I do this? But like, I just felt, I just didn't feel ready to go home and everything was handled. Like the pets were all set for a month. Like every, there was nothing really urgent. And so I knew that once I went home, I would be dealing with this and there would be no going back. And I think I wanted to put that off a little bit. When when you tell the story that, do you ever get the impression that people are thinking, okay, her dad died and then she went on vacation and then went home. That just seems kind of odd. I mean, do you have to explain that to people, what the reasoning was behind that? Or maybe they don't even ask. I mean, no one has ever asked that. I feel like they must be thinking it because I would be thinking it. Like, I don't have an explanation. I know it's weird, but the whole situation was weird. Today's the day I get to do something I love. I get to tell you about a new podcast that I haven't talked about before here on the show. And this is one that I find absolutely fascinating. It's called DNA Today. This podcast is all about genetics and all the new advances in the world of genetics technology. And that world covers a lot of topics. This includes home DNA kits. You know, we've talked about those here on this podcast. You'll hear about this gene editing technology called CRISPR, which actually has possibilities in the treatment of inherited genetic diseases. And you'll learn about some really rare diseases. In fact, there was a recent episode where they talked about Farber's disease, which I'd never even heard of before. The host is Kira Deneen. 
She's a certified genetic counselor, and she really knows this stuff. But she's also able to explain the complex concepts so that listeners like you and I, who aren't scientists, can understand it too. And as intelligent as she is, I have to say it was kind of fun on a recent episode when she sort of fangirled with the celebrity guest, Atticus Schaefer. You might remember him as Brick on the sitcom The Middle. He has a genetic disorder called osteogenesis imperfecta, which is also called the brittle bone disease. They talked about how he's been able to deal with that throughout his life and how he's working to raise awareness. I get all the new episodes because I'm subscribed, but there are like 200 episodes out already, so you'll never run out of things to learn about genetics. You can get it on your favorite podcast app like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts by searching for DNA Today or at the website dnatoday.com. And thanks to the DNA Today podcast for sponsoring this episode. Before he died, I had been planning to come home and clean the hoarded house. I was like, I'm finally going to deal with this. They're going to get on board. Like, we're doing this. And like, they were not happy to hear that. And they just kept being like, whatever. And I was like, nope, we're going to do it. It's going to be great. I'm like researching cleaners to help who are in Rhode Island. And I'm like writing manifestation affirmations and gratitude literally every day, like a psychopath of like, I love my parents' beautiful home. Like it was like, I was, I was like, I had lost my mind. And I'm also, of course, like, and I'm so grateful for my dad's health and happiness. Like just this like manic gratitude practice. And so when he died, it was like, we had these plans to go on this trip and then to clean the house. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go on this trip for a month. Then I'm going to come home and I'm going to clean the house. So I was helping to plan the memorial service virtually from the Philippines, like via email with the, the funeral director and my mom. And yeah, it was bizarre. And then I got home. By the time I got home, it was March. So he died January 12th. I got home at the beginning of March. It was not good. It was the winter of 2015 for anyone who lives in New England was like memorably brutal. There was like four feet of snow on the ground, which is not typical. And it was like brutally cold. And it had been one of the most depressing winters, people said, for a while, which I'm like, I wonder if that contributed And so I got home and that's when the journey began of cleaning the house and working with my mom and like trying to rebuild. So once you were done backpacking and you thought, okay, now is the time to go home and you've got that plane ride. How long was the plane ride? It was, well, longer than it should have been. Um, So I flew from Taiwan to Korea, which is quick. But then I flew from Korea to Dallas, which I think was about 11 hours. But Dallas got a snowstorm, which for Dallas was one inch of snow. But they weren't equipped to deal with one inch of snow. So the entire city and all the airports shut down. So I got stuck in Dallas for 48 hours. I mean, a long time. I couldn't get my bags back um, because they had already checked and like moved on. So I was stuck in the Dallas airport with no toothbrush, no change of clothes, nothing like going through the worst experience of my life, sleeping on the ground, eating vending machine food, like calling my mom crying, like, mom, what do I do? Like, how do I get home? And she's just like, I don't know. I don't know. And it was just like, it was crazy. And then the flight from Dallas to Rhode Island is probably what, five hours maybe? We couldn't get a flight to Rhode Island. So it was like one of those situations where you just keep booking and booking and booking flights and they just keep canceling. So we were trying different airlines, we were trying different airports. We eventually got a flight to New York because my partner's family lived on Long Island. So we flew into New York City because it was the only flight that we could get after two days in the airport. It was from a different airport in Dallas too. So we drove to a new airport without any bags 
and then took this flight from that other airport to New York because that was the only thing that we could do to get close to home. And so then we were with his family for a day or two and then took the ferry to New London and then drove from New London to Providence. It kind of sounds like planes, trains, and automobiles, you know, <laughs> trying it, to get from yeah. the international version. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been a stressful travel experience, even if my dad hadn't just killed himself. But like with that in the mix, it was, I, I was like, it was one of those things. And this was a theme from kind of this point through finishing the house clean of like just this stuff that was like, this cannot be happening. Like there's no way that this many bad things could happen in a row. Like this seems made up. I kept feeling like, like, am I on a, like a movie or a TV show? It cannot be real. Somebody's going to jump out and say, you've been punked. I really thought that. So when you're, you've got all these hours, like even that, the first, the 11 hour flight to get to Dallas, all that time just to sit and think, what are the, what are the thoughts that are going through your head about what you're about to get into? I mean, some of it is a blank. It's sort of like those early days, those few months afterwards, it's like new realizations just keep hitting you. I remember this moment on the flight. I don't know if it was the flight to Korea or the flight from Korea to Dallas, but I just, I was just sitting there holding my passport because we had just had to show them. And I just like mindlessly opened my passport and my dad's my emergency contact. And I was like, what do you do if your emergency contact is dead? Like it was just... Those all those little things that you don't think of at first just keep hitting you like, oh, my God. Well, let's talk about when you finally got back home. First of all, was this the house you grew up in? Yes, basically. We moved into that house when I was in fourth grade. It is a six bedroom Dutch colonial built in 1900. It's a it's a big house. And I have to ask you this. As far as the hoarding. Was it mostly your dad or was your mom also a hoarder? Because, I mean, hoarding, from what I know, it's it's a mental health disorder. So it would seem kind of odd that they would both have it. Right. Um, it's hoarding is a spectrum, like I believe all things. So it's tough, like hoarding I also believe, and there's a lot of different types of hoarders, and there's a lot, I mean, the research on this is emerging, but hoarding can result from a lot of different things. It can, some people associate it with people who have types of OCD. There's a lot of correlation between trauma and hoarding. So that it's not necessarily that there's a chemical issue, it's that all this unprocessed trauma can lead to this disorder, this attachment. They've also done research showing that people who are hoarders or who have a tendency towards hoarding, which a lot of us probably have but don't act upon because we're feeling good and we're taking care of ourselves. And But they did experiments where they showed, they scanned people's brains and the part um, for hoarders, the part of the brain that's associated with really strong emotion lit up over kind of minor objects. Whereas for someone who's more, more average in that area, more typical, that didn't happen. And so they did experiments where they like, they had junk mail and they let the people sort the mail and say, this is junk. And then they shredded the junk mail in front of them and scanned their brains. And there really was this like heightened emotion from people who were hoarders. So there's a lot of complexity to hoarding. There's also, I took a DNA test and there's a genetic marker that I have that is uh, possibly shows difficulty parting with objects that are no longer needed. And so there's like this complex web of things that create this situation, I believe. I think trauma plays a big part in whether or not that tendency gets flipped on or not, um, which I, I believe that both my parents and most people have gone through trauma and their generation was not as vocal about it. And as you know, they didn't understand it as much. So it wasn't the type of thing that you like tried to get help for. You were just like, you know, walk it off. 
So were they both hoarders? Yes. Like it wasn't always so bad. Like my mom is very, very ADD. And so she has a lot of trouble with organization and and spaces and stuff like that. My dad's hoarding was more this sort of indifference. Like it sort of seemed like just a lack of care. Like he would just, he just didn't care about the mess. He sort of lived like, like 19 year olds. There's just trash and bottles. And like, if he can't find something, he'll just buy a new one. It was less an attachment to the objects and more just kind of an indifference that I think stemmed from a lot of unprocessed trauma and depression and just not caring about himself and feeling overwhelmed. Whereas my mom, I think has more of the typical attachment to objects and the like just overwhelm at like trying to understand how to organize things. So there's a spectrum, the combination of the two of them together with the pets, with them both working long hours and not having a lot of time, not having learned the skills for how to manage a house, which is a skill, right? Like learning how to, it's not, I think people think it's this thing that you should just know how to do, but it's not. And so that was sort of the perfect storm. So I would say that's a very long way of saying it's both of them, but it's complicated. Can you describe walking through the door the first time when you came back home? Yes. It was freezing cold. I got out of the car. My mom was like frantically trying to shovel the steps. And I like walked over to her and she doesn't even like look up or acknowledge me. She's just like frantically shoveling. And I say this with no judgment because she had just been through insane trauma. But I was like, I haven't seen you in two years. I was like, Hey mom. And she was like, Hey, like, and just like really focused and stressed about the stairs. And I was like, okay, this is going well. I walk in the door. I've got like my, the strap, my bag is like digging into my arm, but of course there is nowhere to put my stuff down. It's freezing in the house. There is stuff everywhere. There is no clear surfaces and the smell of cat urine is so strong that even in the cold weather, it like burns. This was, I think, the beginning of March, but it was like a really long winter. Like it was freezing still. So you were planning to stay here, stay in that house, right? While you were doing the cleaning. Was there even, was there a place for you to stay? Was there a room that had space for you? Not really. So the setup was I used to live on the third floor, like, which is, was a really nice setup. It's like since fourth grade, I had that space, which my wife says is why I'm so spoiled now, but it's like two bedrooms and there's a full bathroom up there. So that was like my space for me and my cats. But my dad had taken over that space while I'd been away. So it had been trashed. And there was just like one twin bed that with like a really hard mattress. So it wasn't like my partner and I were both there and it was like, it was not in a condition that you could stay up there. So there was just like this spare room, which like the whole house was just like spare rooms that were full of stuff. Cause it's like a big house full of bedrooms that are unused. So the rooms are just labeled by the color that the room is not by the function. Cause there is no function. So there was, a, there's a room called the blue room that had a big desk in it, had like all these papers, just like clothes and piles of stuff. And there was just, my mom had bought a new mattress, which to her credit, thank you. And it, so there was like a full, a new memory foam full mattress in the middle of this room that was like full of junk, but there was nowhere for my stuff. And so we just slept on the mattress on the floor in this random room full of stuff. And I just remember waking up in the morning when it was light out and realizing that a cat had either thrown up or like poop right next to the bed. And I'm just like, great, <laughs> this is this is lovely. <laughs> well, I guess that made you, or that helped you decide which room to clean first, right? <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and cleaning it was such a process. Like it, they were, it was such a phased process because first we had to get it to the point where I could like live. And then when my partner went back to be with his family in Long Island for a little bit, I would just sleep in my mom's bed with her because it was like, it took a long time to carve out a space for me. Can you just describe what was in this, all these piles of stuff? 
What was it? Just like nothing like really noteworthy. Like it wasn't like tons of like newspapers or anything. It was just stuff like clothes, fans, papers. It just tons of stuff, extension cords, all the objects that you would expect to see in a house, but like at a huge volume and everywhere. And like the thing that made it really challenging was the pets. Because when you have pets, you can't have piles of stuff places, especially if you have cats. I love cats. But like if you have a cat, you probably know that cats love to pee on piles of clothes. Like they just, it's like a rare delicacy for them. (laughs) And so they can't help but treat themselves. And when you don't clean up a pet's mess right away, other pets and they will continue to mark. So it was like the rugs, the clothes, like the furniture under the clothes. Like it was just stuff had like soaked through. There were piles of like shirts and New Balance sneakers of my dad's in a closet. And It had been peed on so many times that the rubber on the shoe had melted to the hardwood. Like, I was like, how does this chemically even happen? Like, so there were so many layers, right? Because you get the stuff off, but then the thing under the stuff is so damaged. And so it was just layers and layers and layers. You seem like a really organized person. Like you would look at a project and plan it out. Like, this is how we're going to do it. Did you come up with some kind of a plan to tackle this? I mean, it would seem overwhelming to start with. Yes. I am pretty organized. I like to just tackle things. I had spent two years in Taiwan thinking about how I was going to tackle it and researching, which was helpful. But when I got there, it was really overwhelming. And I think it was like, because my dad had just died and like, I might have given up with enough pushback if my dad had still been there and just been like, you know what? Okay, it's your life. But like knowing that I was going to leave my mom to live in this house alone as a widow to rebuild her life, I was like, I can't, this has to be dealt with. So if I had felt like I had had any choice, I probably wouldn't have taken this on or I would have quit. But that feeling of not having a choice was helpful. So this was such a great experience. I mean, it was like the worst, it was the worst experience. But in terms of like business, this was the best experience because I came into a seemingly impossible situation with none of the skills, experience, or team that I needed to deal with it. And I had to just figure it out. And everybody told me in the beginning that I couldn't do it. They were like, no way. It's too much. Don't take this on. You've been through enough. There's no way you can do this. I had cleaners come in, tell me the house was going to be condemned, that I should just give up. They told me there's no way I could even do anything with the house. And I was just like, I mean, I would cry. Like I was affected by it, but then I'd like keep Googling and find somebody else. So the first thing I did was try to find someone to help me, which I think is true for business too, is the smartest thing you can possibly do is like find someone who does this seemingly impossible thing all the time and knows how to do it. And so I was looking for an expert in cleaning and hoarding after talking to some truly horrible people who were just like said terrible things to me or about the house and just made me feel hopeless I found this woman, Nicole, and she was like, this is what she does. She had this like kind of crappy Comic Sans font like website. But when I read her website and she talked about why she does this and why she feels like compelled and moved to help hoarders, I was so touched because she was the first person who approached it with compassion. I had her come over. Her and her husband came over. They looked around the whole house. And after so many people telling me to give up, the house is going to get condemned. You can't do it. Nicole looked at me. I, I love this woman. She looked at me and she said, you're so strong. You've been through so much. I'm so sorry for your loss, which no one had said. And then about the house, she was like, this isn't even that bad. We can totally do this. And it was like, finally. So that first massive breakthrough came from finding the right who. How did your mom handle that process? I mean, was she able to help or was it just all you or did she kind of say, no, no, we got to keep that one thing 
and or how involved was she? Yeah, my mom is scary. Mom, if you're listening, I say that with love. So she was a federal prosecutor. She was the first United States attorney, the first female United States attorney in the state of Rhode Island. She's a scary lady. So, and I say that with respect. She was not on board. And it was a real, it it added a big layer of complication to be working with someone who wanted at first to block me. And it wasn't, and it wasn't her fault, right? If you come into anybody's life and you're like, cool, we're going to change everything, no matter who they are, they're probably going to be like, get lost. Add on top of that, that they've just lost their husband to suicide. Like, and you're like, hey, going to need you to go through this box real quick. It's like, get away from me. So she was not happy, but there was a part of her I could tell that was more willing to work with me than ever before. And I don't know if her you know, resistance had been broken down by the loss. I suspect it had more to do with the fact that she felt really sorry for me because me and my dad were really close. So the fact that I had lost my dad to suicide, I think made her more willing to work with me out of pity, which is fine. I'll take whatever, whatever I could get to get the job done. And so she was really resistant at first. And it was just like fight after fight. And in the beginning, it took her days to go through a single box and she would be, you know, mad at me and really like grumpy and negative and like kind of making mean comments. And I'm just like, this is going to be a long time. If it takes this many days to go through one box, like this does not look good. But bringing in Nicole was really helpful. Having a third party come in is really helpful to get people on better behavior. And so like there, there's things that just like, you know, if your family tells you, you're like, shut up. But if a really compassionate expert comes in, you're kind of like, okay, you know, like they're saying the same thing, but it hits different because it's a different relationship context. So Nicole was really helpful in getting my mom to cooperate. And then we did hit this point. So it was like pushing a boulder up a hill for a long time, like months of like basically fighting against my mom when she was trying to block this. But then we hit our stride. We started hitting this momentum and she started getting pretty good at going through stuff. And she started working with me. And like, I don't know if she just gave into the inevitability that this was going to happen and I wasn't going to back down or if the momentum just made it easier or both. But she, we did get better and better at working together once we got that initial momentum. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. I recently bought a new car, and I love the feel of newness when I drive it. But imagine if you could only have one car for your entire life. That means you have to make it last, because you aren't going to get another one. Can you imagine how well you'd take care of that car? Well, guess what? That's how our brains work. We only get one. So we should treat them the same way. I mean, how we care for our minds has a direct effect on how we experience life. So it's an investment that's really worthwhile. You've heard lots of guests on this podcast talk about going through traumatic situations, and so many of them talk about how valuable and helpful it was when they got therapy. It really does make a huge difference. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that you can do by video or phone or even live chat sessions. And it can be done with or without a camera. It's whatever you prefer. You might be surprised to find out that it's much more affordable than in-person therapy. And you can be matched up with your therapist in under 48 hours. And because you're a What Was That Like listener, you get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash what was. You only get one brain, so let's make sure it's healthy. That's better h e l p dot com slash what was and get your first month at ten percent off. And thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. It took exactly five months because I moved to Colorado 
the day that we finished. It took exactly five months. I took one single day off. And I'm not a grinder. I don't work like that. I'm not one of those entrepreneurs who's like works at 5 a.m. and is the, the last person to stop working. No, I am not a grinder. I don't work well that way. But this project to hit this deadline required that. So every single day I woke up at like 5 a.m. and I would start cleaning around like six or seven. I would finish around like eight. I would fall into bed, make my to-do list for the next day, go to sleep, wake up again, five months every single day. And it was amazing that we were able to get it done in five months. It must have been difficult to do that every day not just because of the hard work involved and such an overwhelming project, but you were also still mourning your dad at that time. Yeah. That that must have been a mental strain. Well, it was and it wasn't. I think that having a project like that helped me to channel a lot of energy into something. And I think it somewhat served as a distraction But also, I think because it was a suicide, because I was out of the country, so not only did I not get to see him before he died, like you would if he died of cancer or something, I didn't see his body afterwards. Like when I saw him, I hugged him goodbye at Logan Airport in 2013, and the next time I saw him, he was in an urn. So there's not a lot of closure there. And so being able to physically process his stuff and go through and touch every single thing that he owned and make a decision about throwing it out or donating it, it was it was really powerful. And honestly, what I felt most was I felt that it was an honor. My dad was an amazing person. He was so, he was like the funniest person I've ever met. And I'm not just saying that because he was my dad. Like, He was like really funny. He was so smart. He loved animals. He was just such a wonderful person. And it was an honor to be able to do that for him. Can you talk about the moth infestation? Yes. So this is one of many things that happened where I was like, this cannot be real. This is insane. So... I'm going through room by room and like we're doing pretty well. And I open the door of the orange room because, like I said, they're named after colors because they have no function. I open the door to the orange room and I'm just kind of like looking around and kind of taking stock of the different piles and like started making a game plan for the room in my head. And then I'm like, oh, like a little moth. (laughs) Like, isn't that nice? I see like a single little, one of those like small moths like fluttering and I'm like, oh, so beautiful. And then I see another moth and I'm like, huh. And then I realize that there's just hundreds of moths in the room. And I'm like, this is a horror movie. It's like I look closely and they're like eating the drapes. They're like swarmed over this one part of the carpet eating it. They're like in all the boxes. And I'm just like, oh my God. So I like close the door. I'm horrified, but I'm also laughing because my dad had this really irreverent sense of humor. And I just thought of like, All the people I've heard say, like, my loved one visited me as a beautiful butterfly. And I'm like, of course, my dad visited me as a (laughs) swarm of moths because he thought it would be so funny. (laughs) So I'm like, okay, well, you know, this is why exterminators exist. So I start calling exterminators and they didn't believe me. They were like, no, that doesn't happen. Like that doesn't happen with that type of moth. And I was like, I'm telling you, it's happening. (laughs) And every exterminator I called wouldn't help me. They were like, sorry, we don't do that. Which again, was one of those things where I was like, how is this possible? It seems like it should be an easy job. You just put a, you know, one of those um, cans where you bomb the room with some fumes or something and just kill all of them. Right. And I was like, why can't an exterminator do this for me? And that was such a theme of like going to professionals and being like, this is what's going on. And then being like, no way. Like, and I'm like, yeah, of course. So 
I eventually I went that DIY route of like, all right, we got to set off a bug bomb, but the house is like full of pets. So there was a lot of logistics because I had to find a place for all the cats and stuff to safely be while I did the bug bomb and then enough time passed. So I did, I did that. It, it was a many more steps than I thought it would be like everything in that house was, but we do the bug bomb. Everybody's safe. The pets are in their locations. I clean up all the little moth corpses. That room is now full of cedar. (laughs) Like there's just like cedar in random places because I just can't take a chance again. But so we did overcome the moth infestation, but it was just one of those things that it's like you wake up thinking that you're tackling one problem and then you end up spending days on this thing that you're like, this shouldn't even be happening. (laughs) Can you just describe seeing the truck haul away that last bit? of stuff. Yeah. When the truck took the dumpster, it was crazy. That was like either the day I was moving or the day before, like it was like the very end. It was incredible. First of all, I had become attached to the dumpster because being able to throwing things in a dumpster is really fun. And being able to just like throw things in the, like I was like dumpster crazy. I I lost myself at that dumpster. Then I got really crazy about people not like throwing their garbage in it. And like, if I saw them, I'd like go outside and be like, that's not your dumpster. I really lost myself. I had a very small world. Um, dumpster territoriality or something. That's kind of odd. I yeah. know. My mom still calls me the dumpster queen because I was like obsessed with this dumpster. Yeah, they like the truck comes, they cover it over, and then they drove it away. I guess I couldn't believe it. The amount of stuff that was gone and like coming to an end when you're in a project like that, you just are so in it in the day to day that you don't pick your head up that often. So to finally pick my head up and to have it be done and like the house, like people said the house looked like it was like staged for sale, like empty. I had managed to get all the cat urine smell out of the hardwood floors with a variety of aggressive home remedies. Like it was, it was incredible. This essentially was an impossible project that you took on and you did it. You won. How did that change your outlook on your life? The change wasn't immediate, but it totally changed my understanding of my own abilities and my understanding of what's possible. And the interesting thing is I feel like in books and movies, this huge breakthrough happens and then that's it. Like things are great. But that's not really what life is like, right? Because it's just this never ending thing. So it's like there was this huge high with finishing the house, this big victory. And then immediately we started driving with the U Haul and my cats to live in Colorado, which I mean, I probably should have known that was a bad idea to like go somewhere where I had no job and no friends and no support right after my losing my dad. But I was just like, well, we got to like keep going and go with the plan and carry on. And he had gotten into a PhD program. So I was like, well, we're going. And as I left and like drove to Colorado, the grief and pain that I had been avoiding slash channeling into the house project started to really catch up with me. And so when we got to Colorado, things went downhill very, very fast Um, with my mental health, with how my relationship was going. it, It was very bad. And I hit a series of rock bottoms. And then it was through coming back from that that I reached my full capability as a leader with the lessons I had gotten from the house clean. But I really had to go down further to go up. Since then, you've done some pretty amazing stuff. I know the company that you're with now, you started as a $15 an hour employee. Now you're the CEO of that company. And we could probably talk for an hour just about that process. But can you kind of summarize how did that happen? Yeah. And so much of how that 
became possible was because of what I got out of that house clean. Like the attitude, the things I learned about tackling seemingly messy, impossible problems, which is so true for business, especially early business. And then also the personal growth work I had to do. Like I had to eventually get into trauma processing therapy and like process losing my dad and process all the stuff before that, that I hadn't processed. I got kicked up by that loss. So I did so much work on myself as a person. And then also the combination of that and having taken on this huge project and succeeded that when I came into this situation and I had, I knew I wanted to work from home and I wanted to start my own business. And I was trying to start a business in the fitness industry and it was not going well, but I really thought like that that's what I wanted was a fitness business. And so I had been connected with Jess, my business partner now, because we worked together and we actually didn't know each other that well. And we're just like vaguely connected on social media. We reconnected because she adopted my dad's cat when he died. And so she went from this person who had been like a colleague who I didn't know very well to like someone who was really on my radar because now she's like sending me pictures of kitten. And that was such a bonding moment. So it was like all these things came together. I wanted a remote job. I saw Jess posted on Facebook that she was hiring um, 1099 part-time contractors at $15 an hour to book people on podcasts. And I truly had no idea how I would financially survive at with a contractor position, no benefits, paying self-employment tax, part-time hours, $15 an hour. But I wanted to work from home. I was tired of driving in the snow in Colorado with no four-wheel drive. So I interviewed, I got that. And then things started happening very quickly from there. I started listening to my clients' podcasts um, and really getting to know them, listening to their interviews. And I was like, oh, I want to be a business owner. Like, this is amazing. I'd already been trying to start a business. But as I got to see all these success stories in different industries and like I started learning, like I started Googling what is SEO, what is content marketing, like these things I was hearing in the episodes. This was 2016. This wasn't that long ago. And I didn't know any of these terms. So my relationship, so actually working with Interview Connections is going great. The rest of my life, not great. I don't really have close friends in Colorado. I didn't want to leave the house. I just wanted to be home with my cats. My relationship is going very badly. So we end up breaking up. And almost exactly a year after arriving in Colorado, I leave Colorado to go home and live with my mom, which felt like a new rock bottom. But there was space for me because I had just cleaned out the house. So that was the silver lining. So I'm 27 and I'm going back to live with my mom. I start going to therapy and taking therapy like incredibly seriously. And Jess asked me at the end of 2016, I'm a contractor that whole year, and I just start taking on leadership responsibilities and like looking for ways to improve the company and to improve my client experience because I really wanted to do a good job. And she asked me to become the first employee of the business at the end of 2016. So I say yes. I go home. I cry my eyes out to my best friend because I don't want to be an employee. I want to be a business owner. But, you know, she's like, this is going to be a great opportunity. So I show up January 2017 as the first employee. And then we have it, the rest of the team as contractors besides me and Jess. Almost immediately, Jess heard uh, an HR person speaking about contractors versus employees and was like, we need employees, not contractors for what we're doing. So in a very short time, we got rid of all of our over 10 contractors and hired local in-state Rhode Island employees. And I was like in charge of this. And I had no experience. Like I was in way over my head with this. But I had just come out of this house clean. So it was like all of this stuff that kept coming up. I was like, I'll figure it out. Like no problem. Because I had this new confidence that I wouldn't have had before that I can basically figure anything out. And so it was a very steep learning curve. Mistakes were made. But like just bringing that attitude that I had developed of like, we can do this, no problem. Anything that hit us, it was like, no worries, we can deal with it. And there was definitely like crying and and those moments, but I had processed so much in therapy that I was just like so resilient. And Jess and I started a podcast, Women Splaining, that I wanted to start because I wanted a podcast where we could just like talk about anything. And we did talk about death on that show too. 
we were partners on that project. We would work on it on Sundays. And then we started to talk about partnering on other businesses and potentially starting a media company. And she knew I really wanted to be a business owner. So we were talking about all this stuff. And then we started talking about potential equity and interview connections. And so the end of my first full year as an employee, we're in these kind of negotiations and I asked for 50% equity. And then there was like a counter offer. And I was like, look, I'm not going to take less than 50% equity. I'm not being a diva, but I just like, I want to have equal risk and equal reward. And I don't want to feel like anyone's my boss. And if there's any inequity, it's going to feel like there's an imbalance of power. So it wasn't a negotiation tactic. I just like stuck to my guns. I had a vision to bring the business from 400,000 to a million in a year. I was like, we can do this. Here's how, here's all the things that we can do. Like we can do this. And ended up getting getting the equity and was co-owner at the beginning of 2018. So your kind of your optimism maybe was a little bit contagious with her thinking, wow, this could be a really big forward step for the company. And obviously, as I've seen and a lot of people have seen what's happened since then, it's been like skyrocket. I, one of the things that you talked about on your podcast was the stuff that you discovered that Malcolm Gladwell wrote about and well, just explain, explain that. I, it's just fascinating to me. What, what did you find? Yeah, this was so fascinating to me too. So I started down this rabbit hole because I was looking to create content and I was working with a great coach, Jacqueline Nagel, who helps people with messaging and content. I was looking to create more content around my lived experience and was struggling to sort of explain what happened because it was like, I was like this kind of negative, miserable person. And then my life fell apart and I lost my favorite person in the world. And then I was like so much more successful and happier. And it was like, I wasn't really sure how to explain that. And so I did research as I was kind of creating content and seeking to better understand this. And I started stumbling on um, the primary one being by Malcolm Gladwell, these studies about the connection with grief and high performance. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, yes, like this, this is it. And so he coined the term eminent orphans and did studies of these highly influential people like presidents and all this stuff and found that for these people who had been presidents, who were super influential, who had multiple, more than one paragraph in the encyclopedia, they had a much higher percentage of having lost a parent than you would find in the general population at that time which I thought was really interesting. A lot of it is focused on people who lost parents young. When my dad died, I was 26. So I wasn't like super young, although I felt young. I, I think I was sort of floating around and not taking responsibility and kind of killing time by being an English teacher. But there were some older ones, but I just found it so interesting, this correlation between loss and high achievement. And why is it? Why is it that some people fall apart because of loss and some people, it seems to be a catalyst for this expansion? And so that is my interest in that is what led me down this rabbit hole of starting my podcast, We Get It, Your Dad Died, where I interview high performers and high achievers who have gone through a substantial loss. And I talk to them about not just what happened with the loss. Usually it's a death of someone very close to them, but I've had some people talk about sexual assault and some other things. And so we talk about the loss, but then they also share about these really incredible unexpected gifts that they got out of this experience that helped them have a much bigger impact and show up in a more powerful way. And it's just hearing these stories has been so incredible and really in an anecdotal way supports what I learned from Malcolm Gladwell about this connection between high performance and loss. Yeah, it is. When you, when I heard you talk about that, that I just, I never would have guessed that, but obviously you have kind of lived that out. And, you know, you and I are friends on Facebook. I subscribe to your podcast. And so a lot of the content that you create, I consume 
And I have to say, you're honestly one of the most insightful people I know. Uh, you just, you have a gift for figuring something out and then explaining it. And I'm like, yeah, I can use that. So I hope you keep doing that. And so let's talk about your podcast. It's called, We Get It, Your Dad Died. And that, when I first saw that title, I thought that is so odd. Where did that come from? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for all that nice stuff you said. That means so, so much to me. And I'm so like honored to hear that and happy. Um, yeah. We Get It, Your Dad Died is a weird title. And I think I it had to be sort of weird for it to feel on brand with me and with my dad. My dad had a very irreverent sense of humor that he has passed on to me. And so I came up with that title as a joke. It was not going to be the actual title because I, you know, my business books people on podcasts. I am a client of my business. So I, I get out there on podcasts all the time. And that's a big part of how my messaging and storytelling has evolved by getting interviewed on so many podcasts every single month. And I just kept telling the same story. Like, it just kept coming up, right? Because the loss of my father is such a pivotal piece of my leadership and business journey that I end up in some way talking about it on every show. So it just got to the point where it, it just felt like I was talking about it so much. And so I just made the joke to someone I was working with of like, let's just call it, we get it, your dad died. <laughs> And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to keep that. And I'm always worried that guests are going to be like super offended, especially if they lost their dad. But everyone's been very cool about it. And it is a respectful show. It, but th I like the irreverent title. It is. And, and you can be respectful and still have some humor, even awkward type humor. You know, I mean, if you go to a lot of times you go to a funeral, it's not just everybody being sad. Somebody will be telling a story about the person that died and everybody laughs because, you know, something is funny. Yeah. There's a lot more comedy in death than I would have imagined. Like the aftermath of my dad dying, those dark moments were so dark, but there were moments where we laughed so hard because it was like, there would be something that was so like ridiculous or like, so him. And especially when you're in a dark place where there's so much tension, you just like laugh that much harder. And like I said, my dad was so funny. He was like the funniest person in the world. So as sad as we were and as hard as it was, there were a lot of moments where we would just like lose our minds, like belly laughing. How can people find your podcast? And you do a blog as well. Uh, how can people find all that? How, how can they contact you? Give us all your contact stuff. Yes. So my podcast, We Get It, Your Dad Died, and my blog both live on my website, which is margie with a hard G.com, M-A-R-G-Y. And you can also, obviously, the show's on Spotify and iTunes, and it links out from the website there too. And then if you want to just connect, um, if you heard something that you want to chat about or you have a shared experience, the best way to do that is probably to DM me on Instagram. My Instagram is at HeyMargie, H-E-Y-M-A-R-G-Y. -E In addition to being really smart, Margie is just really a likable person, which makes sense because she's an animal lover like I am. You can get all of her socials and contact info and see a picture of the amazing rainbow-colored stairs in her home at whatwasthatlike.com slash 111. And right now, I just want to take a moment and thank you for being a listener of this podcast. There are over 2 million podcasts in existence right now, so you have a lot of choices on what you listen to. Admittedly, a lot of those podcasts really suck, but a lot of them are really good. And here you are listening to What Was That Like? I do really appreciate that, and my mission is to keep making new episodes and to try to keep making the show better and better. If you get value or entertainment from this podcast, I invite you to consider becoming a patron. You get the new episodes ad-free, and you get extra bonus episodes and you get a personal audio message from me, and you get a What Was That Like sticker, all kinds of great stuff. 
But the best thing really is that you get to be a part of helping the show continue. You can sign up at whatwasthatlike.com slash support. And here we are at this week's listener story. If you have an interesting story you can tell in about five minutes, more or less, call it into the podcast voicemail line, 727-386-9468, and you just might hear it on a future episode. This listener story comes from my friend Ken, who owns his own cleaning business, but he also has a podcast called Smart Cleaning School, where he helps cleaning business owners learn how to run their business more efficiently and make more money, and some of them have reached seven figures. I wonder if he's ever done any hoarding cleanups. Anyway, here's Ken talking about a time he was surprised while working. Stay safe, and I'll see you in two weeks. Some stories you just have to experience to believe that they actually happened. This is definitely one of those stories. So I'm at a favorite client's house of mine. This family used to be home every time I'd visit, but now they're traveling the country and in the husband's new role as a consultant. And so I clean an empty house, a big house, 3,000 square feet, very nice, suburbia, three-car garage. I would park my vehicle just outside the garage on the driveway, and I would go and grab the key from the front because they would leave it in a little dish for me. And then I would go open the back door with the key, go into the garage, open the back door with the key, type in the combo on the padlock in the kitchen to turn the alarm off. And then I would commence my cleaning. So normally I would bring all my gear in and do that process. Well, on this one particular visit, I did not get all my gear in. I forgot a few things, but I got most of my stuff in. Obviously, I got the key from the front porch. I walked around the back. I let myself in, opened up the back kitchen door, turned off the alarm, and started to work. Realized I forgot some paper towels, a filter bag for my vacuum, a couple cleaning supplies I forgot. So I wanted to go back outside to grab the pieces that I needed to clean the house. And so if you can imagine this large kitchen with an eat-in, and then there's a side door that goes into the garage, and the family uses this door. You know, they would park in the garage, and most households, they don't use their front door, let's be honest. They use their side door. And this side door opened up into the garage, which was the main entrance in and out of the house for the family, and it's the one that I used. When I opened that door, I walked down those steps. As I'm walking down, I pressed the button on the garage door, and the door started to open. So I was walking down the steps, across the concrete. I looked out the side windows. I noticed there was a squad car sitting in the driveway. I'm thinking, well, that's interesting. What's the cop doing there? So my first thought goes to, oh, well, gee, you know what? I've had half a dozen times where maybe I tripped an alarm or I forgot something and I opened up a door that was not triggered to, there's all different ways that you can trip alarms. And the cops would come and they would show up and they would ask me for ID and make sure that you know I was supposed to be there and I've been through this before. So my first thought was oh look a squad car. I must have tripped something. Uh, who knows? I didn't realize where the cops were and I didn't know the background of what was going on. So I'll just take you from my angle. And so I perceived to walk and this is like in like the matrix slow motion like here's the garage door opening here's my footsteps clunk 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 i see the squad car i get closer to the garage the garage door is opening i'm about 10 feet away i see a pair of black boots at the bottom of this garage door it keeps going up and then that reveals a pair of gray pants with a blue stripe on the side I recognize that immediately as, oh, that's a policeman, I suppose. So I walked closer to the door. The door gets to waist level. I see his bottom and I see the side arm being pulled up. At the moment that I see that, the nice man in blue says, get on your knees. I'm like, yeah, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. And I got down on my knees as quick as I could. Knees hit the pavement. Ouch. The door keeps going up. Revealing the rest of the cop and the patrolman that was with him, his partner, both of them, guns pointing at the cleaner in the garage. Why? I don't know what I did wrong. Did I not flush the toilet last time I was there? I don't know. What did I do wrong? But I just was on my knees waiting for my instructions. He says, what are you doing here? I said, I'm, I'm just the cleaner, sir. 
<laughs> he looks at me. He sees I have a cleaning shirt on. He says, is that your vehicle? I said, yes, sir. He says, don't move. He sends the partner over. Hey, go check out his car. He goes over, looks at the car, and I hear back, yup, here's a cleaner. I see a vacuum cleaner stuff in here. I see some other things. Unless he's got a really good ruse or he's a con man, I think he really is a cleaner. All right, let me see what you got in your pocket. I said, sir, all I have in here is my wallet, which doesn't have much money in it, and my keys. Here you go. He's like, do it slowly. I'm like being interrogated like I'm a criminal. This is crazy. Gun still pointed at me. Eventually, he lets off of the tension and he says, okay, you can stand up now. Looks like you're good. I need to see your license and your ID. I said, yes, sir. I got my wallet. I gave him my ID and he did a check. I just st- kind of stood there now. And at this point, the partner is running a full scale background check on me to make sure I am who I say I am. And of course, my name probably shows up as yes, cleaner, been background checked five times in the past year for tripping other alarms. <laughs> and so I finally talked to the officer who had, who had cooled down, gun back in holster. And now I'm kind of, you know, my heartbeat, which was fluttering like a butterfly only moments before and I'm freaked out. You know, I just start joking around. I don't know where the jokes came from. I really don't know. Why did I think this was funny? I don't know. I guess I spend too much time alone cleaning houses to think, but I did think it was funny. And so here's what I asked him. I said, so, um, officer, why did you point a gun at me? I'm just a cleaner. And he says, we had reason to believe that this house was being burglarized. I said, okay, sir, that makes sense. I can understand that, sir. Uh, Why would you think that I was burglarizing the house? They said, we got a tip. Okay, what kind of tip did you get? They said, well, one of the neighbors had called and they saw suspicious activity. I said, suspicious activity? You mean like I was vacuuming and cleaning a bathroom? Was that suspicious to them? (laughs) He's like, all right, wise guy. (laughs) Like, I need to shut up sometimes. I really do. He said, no. They said that they saw an unidentified man go to the front of the house, looking all around, trying to break in. And then they saw him disappear to the back of the house, looking around, trying to break in. Then suddenly he wasn't in the back of the house or the front of the house. Somehow he was in the house with the lights on. So they immediately called the cops to report it. So of course I explain my situation. Let me explain this officer. I went to the front of the house because that's where the homeowner leaves the key for me. Then I went to the back of the house because that's where the door that the key works for unlocks. And then I went in the house to clean. So I am very sorry for any misunderstanding. May I go now? And he says, uh, let me just check a few more things out here. Bucko. And I added the bucko. (laughs) And sure enough, after a few more moments, at this point, I'm kind of goofing around with the partner and, you know, asking if he's done this before, if he's ever, you know, pointed a gun at a cleaner or a roofer or a plumber. (laughs) Of course, I'm just being a wise guy. And then I I finally get let go. They take off. They write the report. I go back into clean. I go back. I I call the homeowners to let them know what happened. I said, Mr. Mrs. You know, so-and-so just want to let you know what happened. They are freaking out. They are not happy with the situation. And they go as far as to call the police station and to call the neighbor and to report everything and to let them know in the future that there is a gentleman that comes to our house once a month. He has this car. He cleans for us. He is not a burglar. (laughs) Crazy things happen. Crazy things. So I've never had a gun pointed on me in my days of growing up in the Philadelphia area, the Philadelphia suburbs, doing dumb things as a teenager. Never had a gun pulled on me until I was cleaning a house in suburbia.